Can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can see your screen. Oh, sorry. There yeah, we go. Better. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Shanika. Thanks, uh, Shanika, for the introduction. That was a very, very nice introduction. Um, so today is just to give you an overview of the emergency lighting compliant, being compliant in accordance with LG12. So if you've got any questions, please you know, type in chat, uh, put your hand up and I'll do my best to um, answer your questions along the way. So if I just kick off, um, a little bit about Zempa, uh, just again, to give you a bit of an understanding. We're over 55 years old, based, uh, the factory is based in Spain. We're a traditional lighting manufacturer, so we literally make everything from plastic injection molding to the lenses to populate the PCB boards, uh, the whole lot. So we are we like to keep everything in house as much as we can to maintain control of the whole manufacturing process to give you the flexibility you need on your projects. We're part of a large UK owned lighting company and you probably see a few of the brands there that are within our group so that's just to give you some reassurance that look we are we have been around a while uh, whilst not in the uk but the group has certainly uh, been around a while um, we feel we're customer focused um, we, we will offer lighting designs free of charge take on the full design responsibility as well as compliance audits our certification we carry the usual certification through ISO 9001, 14001, 45001, as well as product certification. So you're not just your the sort of usual C UK CA mark. We do a bit more than that. We go third party accreditation. But if you've got any questions on that, please you know, feel free to give us a, a call and we'll talk more about that. Today we're going to try and learn uh, some four outcomes today is the is the goal. It's about 45 to 40 minutes, so I won't bore you too long, hopefully, because emergency light can be a bit dry. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to try and understand why emergency light is required, how to comply, what are some of the best practices, and what some of the you know what end users should be responsible and uh, for and what they should and shouldn't be doing uh, throughout the install throughout their installations. So if we just talk about what the standard says emergency lighting is for, so it says it's there to provide you safely out of the building under maintenance failure. It's there to shut down any equipment and make it safe. So things like a lathe or something you know, of high, 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 um, high task area. Then it then moves on to work how to locate vulnerable people, whether that's in a lift or on a disabled refuge. It's, that's fundamentally the three things that you should be using emergency lighting for. Um, it's not there to increase your light levels. That's what not what the standard wants you to do. We talk about some of the legislation and standards now. That there is a, a lot, a hell of a lot of standards around there. And depending on your role within the project, you're supposed to know uh, and have a good understanding of all of these from you know, the Fire Safety Act 2021, which was introduced post Grenfell, to 5266, which is the emergency light standard, to then the signage, which is the ISO 7010. Uh, so you're supposed to know and, and have an understanding of all these standards. Don't worry if you don't know, that's okay. You can lean on, certainly lean on Zen or lighting manufacturers to try and help you navigate through some of these standards, which can be quite quite difficult but you're supposed to start so where does it all start well, the RRO was introduced in 2005 and that was for the end a document for the end user so the building owner if you will and it's there to try and bring all those standards together create a, a dynamic risk assessment and to make sure that th that building complies for its fire safety in, in this, it's got four sections, and in section one, it, it asks, well, who's the responsible person, <clears throat> excuse me, for the fire safety of the building? Uh, it has to be a person, usually it's someone of, of uh, responsibility, whether that's a financial director, a managing director, somebody that is in charge of a budget that doesn't need permission to have things signed off, typically. Sometimes the person named on the fire risk assessment can be the same person. Once you've nominated that person and you know who it is, you then go into the duties of what that person should be doing for its occupiers in that building. 
and they talk about how to produce risk assessments from their fire detection, what sort of levels, whether that's L1, P2, L2, P3. It goes into so much detail, emergency lighting, again, what sort of light levels you should be riding in certain areas, their safety drills, and it goes on and on to talk about what they should be doing to be a responsible employer. Then they talk about, well, now we know who the responsible person is. This is what they should be doing. Part three then says, well, this is how we're going to try and make sure that they do a good job. Um, and it's the usual sort of HSC, sort of fire uh, building control um, processes from in inspecting the premises. Again, they can turn up at any point. Any alteration notices, so if they, again they walk around and see anything that's not quite right, they can put an alteration notice into something quite severe, which is a prohibition notice, which can lead to you know, shutting your premises down, which has happened a lot uh, in the last few years where lots of premises are being closed because they breached their fire safety. And they're not afraid to do that either. They're, they're certainly not afraid to do that. Uh, it's worth noting that, you know, if, if you are familiar with the law, um, Normally, the you know the court of law, you have to be proved guilty. So you know you have to have all the evidence to say that this person has done uh, something wrong. In this scenario, when it's fire safety and you're in a court of law, the person that's been accused is guilty uh, from the from the moment you start, and they have to prove they're innocent. So you prove your innocence typically through record keeping. Um, that's how you sort of prove that you've done a good job by your occupiers, your, um, your staff. But it's worth noting you are guilty the second you walk in that court, which is completely different to criminal or any other law. These are just some examples of you know, where it's gone wrong for a building. So this was um, sort of a few years ago now in Oxford Street, London. Um, and again, whenever there's a fire, or something's gone wrong, there's always a risk, uh, sorry, a cause and effect analysis. You know, and that's to go from cradle to grave of what's happened, why it happened, what's gone wrong. And when they did follow that process, there was no risk assessment. So no RRO was, was at all completed. Staff were not trained. I think that you know, there's only two or three staff that were trained several years ago. No fire alarm response. So what that means is on Oxford Street at the time, it was mandatory that in my day it was called Red Care, Red BT Red Care Line. I'm not sure what it's called now, but that was mandatory on Oxford Street. That wasn't there. But the worst thing is there was the push to exit on the final exit door was on the wrong side. So if anybody trapped on the lower ground floor and below, they weren't getting out because that push to exit was on the wrong side. Uh, and they were fined over half a million. And when you're fined, you're in the public domain. So you, know, you, you people like to name and shame people that have been fined. Moving a bit closer now, so we're at 2018, and this was a, um, an Aberdeen market. Uh, there was a power loss. During the power loss, there was no lighting on one of the stairwells, and this poor chap hit his head and a few days later died. And, and they were fined £80,000. Now, some of you might say, well, that's not fair because I get that quite often. Bear in mind, the bigger the company, the bigger the fine. So this little Aberdeen market, 80,000 pounds would mean this probably the same to them as what it would have done half a million to New Look. It's all about percentages on turnover and profit. So if you are a big company and you work for a big company, the HSE Fire Brigade Building Control will like to make an example of you. And we're moving a bit closer now. So COVID, if those that can remember, lots of us were at home either working from home or furlough, whichever it was, but which meant a lot of the fire brigade and building control had lots of time. So they inspected care rooms quite regularly, uh, more regularly than was needed. And again, I think that was just to keep them busy. But this was one in Cardiff, uh, very little uh, uh, very little fire uh, fire safety employed throughout the building. There was The smoke alarms were from a B&Q, if you will, so non-addressable. I think there was one or two emergency lights in the building and they were fined £432,000. So again, that's quite a lot of money. And, and, you know, and if you are named and shamed, people like the FSM do like to publicise this. So it's worth noting it's important that you do a good job. But that, we talked about the RRO. The RRO is a mandatory document. You can see that there's the Parliament seal there on the left. Um, and it does mention and does state that you should refer to 5266 
for your for your emergency lighting. So while some people say it's a code of practice, it's the only one that exists in the UK. So it's the only one that gets used in a court of law. But there is a link to a mandatory document in the RRO. So sort of by default, um, you are you are forced to use it. And what does five two six six say? It goes into lots of detail. And if you ever bored one night, I would suggest I'd recommend reading it. Um, it's quite detailed, but it, the, the long and short of it is it talks about the design, the installation, and some of your system requirements of how you should uh, comply for lots of different applications, whether that be swimming pools right the way through to a flower mill. So, you know, it's very detailed and it's due to be updated this year. So watch out, there's a change coming this year. And again, if you want more detail on that, you know, come and contact us and we'll, we'll share what some of the changes are likely to be. But the standard 5266 sits above all the others. So all the other standards below that point back to 5266 and you've got system standards and product standards. And the product standards are more for manufacturers, system and base guides that that 5266 are for typically installers and designers. But they all refer back in one way or another to 5266. So again, just strengthens, you must use that document throughout your installation and projects. The, immune, you know, the purpose of emergency lighting is you know, you've got three different types. You've got your evacuation lighting, which immediate evacuation, which means run to your nearest fire exit, get out as quick as you can in a safely manner. Another example is stay put. So you, you want to, or safety lighting, this is an application where you want to keep people in the building for a certain amount of time whilst you assess what's going on. An example is, well, an airport. If you've got a big airport like Gatwick, you wouldn't if, do an immediate evacuation of all the people in that airport just for a small fire in a toilet on gate 52. One, it wouldn't be safe, and two, it's just not practical. So you can keep people in the building whilst there's a potential fire going on, but examples are, if you've got an immediate evacuation, your battery duration is one hour, but if you've got stay put or safety lighting, it's three hours a minimum duration. So there's some differences between the two. Um, so they're not all the same. And then your last one is standby lighting. That's where you've got an operating theatre and you need normal activity for a short period whilst a backup system kicks into place. Where, does, where are you supposed to start? Quite often we, we get asked, can you price? Can you do a design? But the standard in section four says that you should start with a consultation. And that's how many, you know, asking questions like, what are your basic factors from how many occupiers do you have? What's your, if you've got an immediate evacuation or stay put, do you have a generator or, or central battery? Do you want automatic testing or manual? And again, all these questions should form, um, should form your emergency lighting solution. And you should be pulling in all of these key people, all of these stakeholders should be pulled in because every person throughout the emergency lighting installation has got a different need and wants, you know, what's important to an installer might not be important to the owner or architect, but you all have a responsibility. So you're, small, you're all supposed to have a say because what you want is a fit for purpose solution. And the example I always use is, you know, Bronze Grove in the, in the middle of the UK is an unmanned railway station. So it wouldn't be best practice to put key switch testing there because that for me is not fit for purpose. You want probably that a bit more automated. Again, it's getting to that granular detail to make sure you're offering that solution that's fit for purpose. Once you've done all that, a design is very simple. It, you know, we can do them one or two hours. They're not difficult, they're not hard, but you do need some fundamental questions asked and then you can provide the correct illumination for the correct application and comply with it. And that's the key bit is you can comply. We just talk about escape lighting now. So the escape lighting, that's your, your, your fire route that's typically defined by an architect, but, but it's defined that's on your fire escape, your fire route, you're highlighting all the doors, shutting down any equipment. And again, talk about that vulnerable people trapped uh, on a disabled refuge or anybody trapped on a lift. So that's your fire route. And typically you're looking for one lux on that route and that's at floor level, everybody. That's not the desk like you would in LG7, that's at floor. Um, so it's worth bearing that in mind. That diversity ratio 40 to one, that's to make sure you've got a uniform of light on the floor. 
and the one lux is easy to achieve it's absolutely easy but achieving it with two fittings instead of 22 well that's the art and typically that's what good designers good end users should be trying to work towards is less fittings open areas standard says anything less than 60 square meters you don't need emergency lighting if it doesn't fall part of the fire route or it deems it in the risk assessment. So if your risk assessment says you need it, then you need it. But if it doesn't, then you could question, well, do you need to put an emergency light in there? But if you do put emergency lighting in open areas that are greater than 60 square meters, you're working to half a lux. But that's the whole area, the whole area. And again, that floor level, that floor level. And again, using that diversity ratio 40 to one to make sure there's again, a good uniform of light in that space. And again, it's worth noting the standards written where you've got it, it, you've got no um, borrowed light, so that's from street lighting or uh, sunlight. It's written that it's in a black room, black carpet, black walls, black ceiling. So again, that's how the standards written. Please don't shoot the messenger. I didn't write the standards, but that's how it, it's supposed. You're supposed to calculate your your lux levels. High task areas, this is the bit we always get asked a lot of is, you know, what's a high task? Well, one is what's deemed by a risk assessor or, or your building owner. But the devil's in the detail here because, because if you define the area as a high task area, you're working to 15 lux. Now, bear in mind, that's 15 times your escape route. So this is where you'll spend the money or where the, the highest risk is in a project. So if you just take that photo as an example, you know, to the naked eye, you would say, okay, well, that's a high task risk. You know, there's loads going on there. Well, if, if you look a bit closer, I would question, well, is that sort of space where the pipes, is that high task? Probably not. That looks like a normal, you know, a normal fire route to me. The high task would be where the gentleman is, where, where he's got that pillar drill. So that, to me, you need 15 lux on that vertical luminance. Everywhere else, you could question it, maybe one lux. So if you get into the detail, you can avoid using things like a central battery, because the more luminaires you put in, the more likely is you're going to need central battery. And then you need to consider more things if you've got a central battery. Points of emphasis, again, you've got to have them in lift lobbies, lift cars. You've got to have five lux at the extinguisher and cold point on the vertical luminance. Again, not on the floor, but on the vertical. And that's because fire extinguishers and cold points now, you can get you know any color you want and all, all the extinguishers are all red. So you've got to be able to pick up that blue or black one. So you need the higher lux levels to see, to make sure you've got the correct extinguisher. Change of direction. So you, you're supposed to put luminaire on a change of direction. That's to increase the light levels, just to, to avoid people slowing down. Because if it is in a pitch black room, and again, black carpet, black walls, black ceiling with fire behind you, if it, you, when you get to a corner, you as a person, will slow down until you can see around it. So to avoid those pinch points, you're supposed to put a luminaire there. You're supposed to put one outside your final door. I think that's pretty common. But the thing that gets overlooked is you've got to light your, your final assembly point. And things like stairwells and such, you're supposed to have one lux on the tread and in your toilets as well. But we see quite often that you know, once people are out the building, the assumption is well, I'm safe now, I'm okay. But the standard says you're supposed to light that route to your final assembly point to one lux. And the further that is away from your building, the more challenges you have because flood lighting in emergency, um, in an emergency mode, doesn't give maybe not a good enough light to get to throw to further away spaces. So you might have to think about bollards, street lights. On, on columns and again if all those are factored in you know more expense needs to be considered so again during that consultation period you you know you can highlight these things and you might you know, where you might have a customer that says you've got 20 assembly points well you question do you really need those that you and you if you can reduce them then you can reduce the cost and ongoing maintenance as well as comply so again that's what that consultation is for to highlight things like this safety lighting this is where you keep people in the building whilst you assess what's going on. Same rules apply, the one lux, but you really have to drill into the detail on your risk assessment. You know, why do you need 
to keep people in the building. And more importantly, you have to get that signed off by your, uh, your fire your brigade and your building control officer. Standby lighting, you know, it's very simple. You've got somebody on an operating theatre. You want that thousand lux as such for three or four minutes whilst the generator uh, sort of spools up and gives you full voltage. And, you know, you can use things like you see there, those lights, they, they can be used. Oh, sorry. Um, labels. Um, so labels on a luminaire can tell you a lot. They're supposed to help the maintenance team or the person carrying out the maintenance on the luminaire through the life of the product. The first one is type of battery. Is it self-contained inside the light or is it a centralized battery somewhere else? So very quickly you can say, okay, that's a self-contained luminaire. Nowadays you only use the zero or one. So maintained is lights always on. Non-maintained means it comes on when there's power loss. So if you do have a one on your luminaire, and the, the light's not lit, then you know the power source, the power, yeah, sorry, the light source is gone. So you, you can do that without opening up a light. And then the installer or the end user is supposed to complete the next section. And that tells you, is it high task? Is there a remote test switch and such? But you're supposed to fill that in. Again, making it easier for that maintainer. And your last bit is the duration of the battery of that, of that luminaire. And be mindful. We're buying lots more products now for across the world. Typically, you, uh, the European manufacturers, they typically supply one hour luminaires. So if you've got an immediate evacuation, technically, yes, you can use a one hour battery, but you need to, re you need to think about reoccupying the building. Um, so, so again, just, just consider that. Um, sorry. For immediate evacuation, you need one hour. So places like offices, schools, if they do need a central battery, that's why you default to a one hour. We're typically self-contained in the UK. They're usually all three hours. But you need three hours where the evacuation is not immediate. That stay put scenario. So places like the nursing home, a hotel, student accommodation, an arena, an airport, they're, they're typically where you would uh, um, use a stay put scenario. Types of resilience. So this is the type of battery you've got for your emergency lighting system. I won't read out the pros and cons. I'll let you sort of digest that for a second. But the bottom two, the central battery and generator, are typically the same thing. But they, you know, one's a static source, i.e. the battery, and one's a moving source, which is the generator. But they're usually typically installed in a similar way. I think we, you know, it's common to use fire-resistant cable, whether that's Pyro or FP200. You should mechanically protect where possible. So again, an outer sheath on these cables with stainless steel clips. But the thing that always gets overlooked is you're supposed to use porcelain terminal blocks, ideally fire rated. Again, because you've got one battery, one generator supplying all your lights, you've got to make sure that wiring, um, certainly the wiring side of the installation, that integrity is maintained. So if you've got to use porcelain terminal blocks where you can for joints, and in my experience, there's, there is hardly any, I won't say there's none, because that's a bold statement, but there's hardly any that I've seen that give you fire rated terminal uh, connections in a luminaire. So you need to provide that outside the luminaire. Light design. So it's, uh, in section six, it says you must put two, compart two luminaires within a compartment. An exit sign can be defined as a luminaire because the luminaire definition says, well, it's a box with a light source within and an exit sign is a light source within inside the light. So you can get away with using an exit light and a one luminaire for, for small fire compartments. Signage, uh, we see this quite often. And these are recent video, uh, recent videos, recent photos. The bottom left is London. Top left was Ireland, and I always forget the one on the right. But what you should be doing is making it clear for that occupier, that person in the building, where they're supposed to go. You know, if you look at those photos, there's, there's examples of what not to do. There's an, a good example. You can see that route. You can see it's clearly defined, and you're supposed to light the, 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 the way out for the occupier, and you're supposed to comply in accordance with the building red you know, with document B as well. Again, there's a page there if you want to refer to it. But the standards ask if the occupiers are unfamiliar with the building, so 
some you know it's got access to the public if you will the exit sign should be maintained that means lit all the time and again that because you as a person if you enter a new space and it's something lit, your eye will be drawn to it so subconsciously you've always made a mental note oh that sign that's where the exit sign is, is to help you help you get the building but also for me personally you know, we're all taught in, when we're young, if there's a fire, get to the floor. Why is that? Well, because smoke rises. If smoke rises where your exit signs are, if you don't light them up, you won't see them. And usually in, in the event of a fire, it's fire, smoke, then power loss. So help the people out the building by lighting them because power loss is always last. So if it was me, I'd have maintained everywhere. Now, I, I appreciate that's a challenge. For some people in the design of the building, I absolutely accept that. But from a safety point of view, I would always lean to maintain. I think I've touched on this, you know, all exit routes should be lit, you know, along the escape route, making it absolutely clear where you should and shouldn't be going. There are two types of signage. You know, you've got an externally lit, which is the top one, which, which again is readily available. These are just signs that you can buy, stick on a wall. And you've got the bottom one, which is, ex you know, internally lit. So that's, you know, from a lighting manufacturer, that's, got a light source from within the product. And you can use both, you can absolutely use both, but there are different rules for both. And if you make a note of the 100 and 200 in the calculation, if you use an externally lit sign, you'll notice it's half the viewing distance, so you need twice as many. So if you do use those, you've got to use twice as many. But something that people gets overlooked is you've got to see that sign in a black room, black carpet, black seat walls, black ceiling. So you've got to have an emergency light next to each one of those to give you that five lux in an emergency mode. So again, just be mindful of that. If you do use the those signs that are readily available, they need to be an emergency light. And that's the bit that sometimes gets overlooked. Signage, um, there's lots of different signs throughout the UK, but the top two shouldn't be used. Um, you know, they've been, withdrawn for some time now. Uh, the second one is an internal uh, document by the hospitals. It's not It's not a code of practice or something that's been passed by parliament. It is a NHS internal document, but it's what they ask for, but it's been withdrawn. We shouldn't be using it. The yellow ones, so the, you know, the traffic light yellow ones, you can only use if you want to just replace a small amount and you want to continue the theme of signage. So what they're trying to do, what they're trying to ask is you have one sign type throughout the building. So if you're just doing a small upgrade or a, a small amount of changes, yes, you can use those two there that are highlighted yellow traffic lights. But if it's a brand new building, you should be using the bottom one, which is to ISO 7010. For new buildings, it's recommended. Something we get asked a lot, is arrow up and arrow down. You should only use arrow up when you're going down. So on the stairs going down, they should not be on your final exit. Your final exit should have an arrow up. And it comes from road signage. So if you're on the road driving and you're going and you're at crossroads and you're going through that road, you'll see an arrow up. That's exactly where it comes from. So if you are putting arrow downs on your final exit, technically you don't comply. You should be putting that as an arrow up. Testing requirements. I think it sounds obvious when you say it, but a competent person should test. Um, quite often we see people testing that's, that are not competent. They haven't had the correct training or, or correct support to show that they can, they, they're competent in the tasks that they're doing. So things like following an apprenticeship or going on these webinars or you know going on courses like the 7671, they all show competence. So it's important to show that you're competent. When you complete your installation and you're handing it over at commission, the standards ask that you do a full duration test 24 hours after it's powered on and record that in your record, in your record book as well. The reason for that is we've all got phones, is most manufacturers of phones will say, let the phone get to 1%, then give it its full charge. And that's because battery technology hasn't changed. To get the life of the battery, you want to allow that full deep discharge and then full charge to give you the life of that battery. So again, the standards reflect that. Testing, what you should be testing. So if you have a central battery system, you should be checking that daily that it's operational and healthy. And that's a visual check. So the standard says visual. 
you could, in my mind, you could, the visual you can only do that by seeing. So you have to walk to the cabinet, see the green indicator, and record that's healthy. Every emergency lighting system needs a short duration test. Again, that's a just quick function test to see the lamps and batteries are working healthy. Again, you record that in your uh, in your log. Every luminaire needs an annual test, uh, and again, that's a duration test. Wherever the battery rate that, and it's typically three hours. So. Each luminaire typically has 12 tests a year, typically. And again, competent person signs that test certificate. And if you are doing test certificates and you see any non-compliances, then you've got a duty to just mark those non-compliances on your te uh, test certificate. Because once you've done that, that non-compliance issue moves upstream to the next person. So again, you, any deviations or any non-compliances, you should be making a note on these certificates. Annex J talks about records keeping. So it says keep the records in a safe place. Safe is quite a vague word, but safe to me means, well, it's a fire safety record. So either in a fire safe, because if the place does burn, then you want to use that in a court of law. So it needs probably in a fire safe or to me digitally, so stored in the cloud. Those to me are probably the only two that I would say is safe. Not safe to me is in a drawer somewhere or in a riser covered next to a distribution board. That to me isn't safe. You know, LED has been around for a while, but for emergency light, it's massively helped us. <clears throat> it means we can put the light exactly where we want it, exactly where we want it, on the floor, lighting that skate route or, or open area. And by doing so, you need a lot less power, lot less power consumption and usually fewer lights as well. So it's massively transformed us for emergency light manufacturers and hugely helped. Standards ask for a minimum CRI of 40, and typically LEDs are beyond that. So again, that's what the standard is asking for. If you just compare now a fluorescent system to an LED, if you can buy them, you know, fluorescents now were I think past that they're you know that, that they're now not to be used. But if you were to compare a fluorescent to an LED, you'll get 4,000 hours at best from a fluorescent if you can buy them. Whereas typically an LED strip is 100,000 hours, and that's 13 years, you know, 100,000 hours, always on. And that's 25 lamp changes throughout the life. So it's important that you 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 know you move towards that change of LED. Again, if you're comparing LED to fluorescent, you've got much bigger spacings, which means you can reduce your quantities by a tremendous amount, as well as your energy as well. Tremendous amount of savings for both the end user and the installer as well. So it makes it a bit, bit better for everybody. This is to talk about what testing is available. Again, it's only my opinion, but I think we should be not using manual testing because I think it just introduces human error. It doesn't mean that it's not compliant. It's just you've got that extra risk. Auto test. So that way the luminaire test itself, you don't need to operate that key switch, if you will. But bear in mind, if you do have an auto test system, you still have to visually go each time to see the charge indicate the status. Sorry, the, the, it, the LED indicate the status, whether that's healthy or not. So you, you're not removing that visual inspection each month. All you're doing is removing the key switch action. And then the bottom one is a network system. So fully addressable, it tells you when it's wrong and it tests when it's supposed to test. And again, highlights any non-compliances if, if it's failing. We can help with that, but there's lots of systems that can do that. I finished, so I'm open to any questions. Um, if all I'd ask, if you, know, if you can complete um, this would be great. Um, Sibzi have asked if you just give us feedback, you can tell how good or bad I've been, and then we can issue your uh, certificate. I've issued in the chat uh, a link so you can complete it online if you want. But if you give feedback, that'd be fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. But is there any, oh, we have the questions. So. Thank you, Craig. Or tell me, it says chat appears to be turned off. I hope it wasn't off for all that. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, they can ask questions at the end. So this is the time okay. to answer any questions. Um, I've got one question from Kamal. Um, do individual windowless WC cubicles need to be provided with e-lighting? So disabled, uh, good question. Uh, disabled um, toilets, yes, you need to provide lighting for those. 
So if it's a general a toilet, off the top of my head, but I can confirm, I'll make a note and I will confirm replacing the standard. Toilets greater than eight square meters, typically, yes, you do need to light. And the cubicles, probably not. It's usually the path beyond there because you know, there's only one way in, one way out from a cubicle. So you would go out that cubicle door and you would, as long as you light the sort of communal area, if you will, you're okay. But I will confirm that. But it's typically more than eight, eight square meters, I think. Thank you. Um, we have one more. Do you need to separate with fire resistance around a battery store as you would locate a generator separately from the primary supply and wire diversely? Oh, God, good question. I'm trying to understand that. It's me being stupid, I know. Uh, do you need a separate to yeah. separate around a fire battery store? Sure. As you locate a generator separately from the primary supply. So no, normally, you don't have to have a separate room. You know, I've seen, I've seen. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about central battery here. I have seen central batteries in a LD uh, in a plant room. I have. So typically, um, you don't need to, um, but it's sometimes good practice to put that in a separate room. But I have seen places where you can put it in a in a, in a combined room. But if you do do put in a combined room, you've got to think about usually heat. If you put it in a plant room, well, there's more heat there. And if there's more heat, you've got to then, well, that's going to have an effect on the battery, certainly the life of the battery, because batteries don't like heat. So it's other factors to think about. Hopefully that helps. Um, Thank you. Next question. Um, what about the single term? I think I answered that one. I think I answered yeah. that. Uh, that you top one, how would... How about disabled WCs in terms of emergency lighting? Lighting, what should be provided? You've answered that one, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yes, you need to put an emergency light in a, in a uh, disabled restroom, and it's one lux. Okay. Uh, okay. I've not got a smartphone to scan. Is there another way to give feedback for the CPD certificate? I put it in the chat. So there's a link. If you go into the chat section, yeah. Um, there's a link there. If you just follow that link, it should, you know, it should work fingers crossed anyway okay not a problem i will send that out to everybody in an email along with the a cave webinar see if you can stick it and i'll send that out to everybody um i think that's the last one for now um but if you guys have any other further questions then um, please email webinars at seabuilde.com and i'll send them over to Craig to answer um thank you everyone for attending and thank you craig for presenting thank you thanks very much with that i'll wrap up and i'll hopefully see you all next month Thanks, everybody.